<sighs> Folks, we need to talk about Karlov. If you have been paying attention to my book-related content, then you know that I have been somewhat hesitantly working my way through Carl Ove Nosgaard's six-volume autobiographical series called My Struggle. I know. This is volume six, and it was exactly at page 280 out of 1,152 that I decided to stop. That's right. I'm DNFing the My Struggle series, and not only that, but I'm also issuing an apology for the fact that I ever read these, and for the fact that I ever put them on your radar. I'm sorry. I sincerely hope that nobody has been influenced to read these because of me. If you are thinking about reading these books, or if you have started reading these books, please, I beg of you, watch this video. You may want to <laughs> stop reading while there's still time. So how did I get here? Well, it all began with book one, which is very unassuming. In book one, Carl Ove has two struggles. One being the time that his abusive father divorced his mom, and then the time that his abusive father died an untimely death due to alcoholism. It's basically just a book dealing with abusive father-related trauma. I even put this book in my top 10 in my 2021 Books Ranked video. I regret that now. Uh, book two is when Carl Ove officially gets cringe a couple times, but it wasn't anything that I couldn't explain away by him being a Gen Xer and sounding like a Gen Xer. So I kept reading. Outside of that, for the majority of the book, it's just him talking about his relationship with his second wife and the kids that he has with her. And his struggle is that he has kids. Then we move on to book three, which details Carl Ove's childhood. So we see a lot of his abusive father back in action. We also get descriptions of these childhood things he does, like go out into the woods with his friends and take dumps in the woods and compare dump sizes or steal pornography magazines from somebody's dad or buy candy. But then you get to the end of the book and the most horrifying thing I've ever read happens, which is that Carl Ove details how he and the other 13 year old boys started sneaking up behind the girls at school and either lifting up their skirts or having one boy run up behind a girl, pull her shirt up, and then another boy come around and grope her. And it's awful. The most difficult to grasp part is the fact that Carl Ove doesn't condemn these actions. He basically presents this as a childhood game that they used to play, and that's it. Why didn't I just stop reading at this point? Ugh. So then I have this whole mental debate of do I keep reading? And in the end, it was basically just the fact that the writing was engaging that kept me going. So I read Carl Ove's book four. And what is the struggle in book four, you might ask? It's the fact that Carl Ove is still a virgin and he spends the whole time moaning the fact that he's still a virgin and trying to lose his virginity and failing. Then I read book five. And in book five, his struggle is that he's trying to become a published author, but he can't because he's not very good. It has a lot of insane stuff happen in it. Like he's in love with this girl. They've been writing letters to each other all summer. She moves close by, she meets his brother. She and his brother start dating behind his back. That was wild. Carl Ove also at this time becomes a raging alcoholic. He is getting blackout drunk an insane amount of times. And when he gets blackout drunk, he commits crimes like stealing bicycles or breaking into cars and stealing stuff out of cars. He also talks about how he dates a girl for a few years and then drunkenly cheats on her, then marries a woman, then drunkenly cheats on that woman. And then the woman that he drunkenly cheated on that woman with threatens to publicly accuse him of rape right as his author career is about to take off. It's deranged and destructive and awful. And the one saving grace with book five is that Carl Ove has some freaking shame. Finally, finally he has some shame. Now we come to book six. And what is the struggle in book six, you ask? It is literally just Carl Ove. The entire essence of his very being is a struggle that I cannot handle. Please allow me to read some passages to you. So this is Carl Ove speaking to his best friend in the world, Greer. Greer is notable for constantly having the worst takes that I have ever read in my entire life. Here's the conversation. There's no alternative either, I said. The only alternative to capitalism in our time has been Nazism. The Nazis attempted to change society from the bottom up and start something radically different, and we know how that turned out. Now Greer responds. It's a shame the Germans lost the war 
but a good thing the Nazis didn't win it, as I usually say. First of all, Greer, what, what, what? Let me just take a moment and read you some of Greer's other awful takes while we're on the subject. Greer thinks women were more free before they had rights. Greer thinks it's bad that when kids grow up and have children of their own, they try to be better than their own parents were. Greer complains at one point that while he was in Iraq to document the war, he was interviewed and was asked, who does the dishes at home? And the point of this question was to determine if he was a good person or not. And I almost don't believe that this happened. I feel like Carl O made this up. I feel like Carl Ove is a painfully unreliable narrator, and I do not trust the things that Carl Ove says, so I'm not even sure if Greer actually said this, because that is just so ridiculously out of pocket. You are in Iraq documenting the war, and people are asking if you're doing the dishes? What? I just can't believe it. I think it's part of Carl Ove's whole thing of trying to be mad at society. But aside from that, aside from Greer's bad takes, let's rewind it to what Carl Ove just said there. Carl Ove said that there's no alternative, there is only capitalism or Nazism. I feel like, Carl Ove, you are forgetting something like, I don't know, the USSR and China and Vietnam and all of the socialist countries that popped up in South America and then got hit with things like embargoes and starvation sanctions and the Jakarta method, thanks to our good buddy, the capitalist US. But the point is, does Carl Ove think that the Nazis were socialists? Does Carl Ove think that the Nazis are like a good representative of all of socialism and communism? Because that's so entirely illogical. Carl Ove, the communist Russians fought against the Nazis and played a pivotal role in defeating the Nazis. So how could that even possibly be the case from the get-go? Also, let's look at it this way. The whole rallying cry of the socialists is workers of the world unite to oppose exploitation. So does it make sense then for a socialist leader to say workers of this specific part of the world unite and exterminate this other group of workers of the world. No, that doesn't make any sense at all. Because Hitler wasn't in opposition to warmongers or capitalists exploiting workers or landlords. He was trying to exterminate Jewish people from all walks of life. He was a freaking psychopath. At this point, I'm about to introduce you to one of Karl Ove's massive concepts that runs throughout this entire book, which is the concept of we, which could mean like society, then the concept of I, which would represent the individual. Here we go. A writer who, for instance, advocates the physical punishment of children or who condemns homosexuality in our day, 50 years after these were generally accepted viewpoints, needs to be extraordinarily inventive if he or she is to be accepted, which is to say forgiven. Whereas a writer who, for instance, denies the extermination of the Jews in the Holocaust would never be accepted or considered to be great regardless of how exceptional a level of literature he or she might otherwise achieve. These two premises of literature, that on the one hand it should be as individual as possible, meaning it should express the inimitability of the singular I, and on the other hand, that it should exist within the boundaries of the general, meaning it should express the we, are at odds with each other, since the more unique I am, the further I am from the we. The fact that Nutt Hampson could pen Adolf Hitler's obituary and include in it the most outrageous sentence in all of Norwegian literature, we bow our heads, and the fact that Peter Handke, perhaps one of the world's three best living authors, if not the best, could speak at the funeral of Slobodan Milosevic, thereby disqualifying himself completely from anything that might be called the cultural majority, are two obvious expressions of the inherent opposition between the unique I and the social we, otherwise known as morality, that literature embraces. So essentially, it seems like he's talking about we in terms of society's morality. We kind of have these generally accepted things things like beating your child is bad, or as he mentioned, more and more people these days are viewing homophobia as a bad thing. But back, say, 50 years ago, homophobia and beating your child were entirely accepted. Is the point here that you can't trust the we because back in the past, society's morals allowed for homophobia, which harmed a lot of gay people? Is that what he's trying to say? Well, let's keep reading and find out. A morality that proceeds from the community of an all, that proceeds from we, is dangerous 
perhaps more dangerous than anything else, because committing to an all is to commit to an abstraction, something existing in the language or world of ideas, but not in reality, where people exist only as separate individuals. In this sense, Nut Hampson and Peter Handke's morality is utterly superior to that of their critics. So at this point, I would like us to read what Nut Hampson actually said, because Carl Ove has just said that Nut Hampson is more moral than anybody who would criticize Nut Hampson. So this is Nut Hampson's obituary for Hitler. I'm not worthy to speak up for Adolf Hitler and to any sentimental rousing his life and deeds do not invite. Hitler was a warrior, a warrior for humankind and a preacher of the gospel of justice for all nations. He was a reforming character of the highest order and his historical fate was that he functioned in a time of unequal brutality which in the end failed him. Thus may the ordinary Western European look at Adolf Hitler and we, his close followers, bow our heads at his death. That is the guy that Karl Ove claims is more moral than we who don't like Nazis? This guy is actively being a Nazi sympathizer, but his morality is way higher than ours because when we hear words like that, we criticize this guy because we don't like Nazis. This is what I've written. Karl Ove thinks morality is bad because it's looking at the we, which is dangerous, which makes the individuals who oppose the we, like a Nazi sympathizer, better than the moral people. How is this the takeaway? Is it so important to be an individual that a Nazi sympathizer is better than a group of people who hate Nazis? There is no logic to be found here. Let's keep reading though. Equality was the supreme principle and one of the consequences was that expressions of the singularly Swedish were seen as exclusive and discriminatory, for which reason they were shunned. When it came to religion, one had to tread carefully. Church had long since been separate from the state, and now things had got to the stage where priests no longer mentioned God or Jesus or the Bible when addressing school children, since this could cause offense to the many who came from Muslim homes. So what's happening at this point in the book is that Karl Ove is at a church for a school function. So this is not a religious meeting, but a school meeting. And the priest has gotten up and spoken and he has not mentioned God or Jesus or the Bible. And Karl Ove is annoyed because he thinks that this is somehow a destruction of Swedish culture because the Muslims are here or something. Here's a note that I wrote when I read this passage. He's currently mad that the church didn't say anything about God or Jesus during a school ceremony so they wouldn't offend the Muslims at a school graduation. He then complains about all the rules imposed by society's morals. But what does he think happens in a church when God or Jesus are mentioned. Surely he is aware that churches pretty much exist to impose extra rules on society, right? He says, very childishly, I might add, that he just wishes he could do what he wants. What does he want to do that society's morals won't let him, I wonder? And also, the stark reality is, he's terrified of anybody ever being mad at him or annoyed with him. He's made that painfully clear throughout this book. So why does he think that he can blame society for not letting him do what he wants? If what he wants to do would make people mad at him or annoyed at him, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't be able to. Is he just mad that people get mad at him when he does or says bad things? And also, if he's so scared of people being mad at him, why did he write these books and fill them with reasons for people to be mad at him? Plus, on top of all of that, he has also at one point claimed that therapy and talking about things doesn't fix anything, yet these massive books could technically be interpreted as him doing one massive therapy session or at the very least talking about things, no? There is so much hypocrisy here. Now let's keep reading. This I took a picture of just because I was so annoyed with how pretentious he was sounding here. Listen to this. This particular I is able to infuse itself with meaning and say something about what an I is without stating anything beyond me. What happens when it is repeated four times? In a sentence, together with all sorts of other words, we wouldn't notice. But unencumbered, naked, and accorded a line all to itself, the utterance becomes preposterous. Me, 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 me. I, 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 I. It expresses narcissism, but at the same time, by its nakedness, it is as if that narcissism is being exhibited. And in this lies a conscious mind, someone saying, I know what I'm doing. What is the nature of that knowledge? I know it's narcissistic, but I'm doing it anyway. That is, I am not hiding myself. I'm telling it like it is. I am at root narcissistic, but who am I? This is what he does in this book. He tries so hard to sound intellectual and philosophical, and it is 
bullshit. This next bit I just took a picture of because I thought like, this is Carl Ove trying to be funny and it's so unfunny. Listen to this. He's describing how he's going shopping and he's picking up eggs. Then moved on and picked up half a dozen eggs. The box said came from cage-free hens indoors, prompting me to scan the other kinds to see if there were any from mistreated hens crammed together in cages, which didn't seem to be the case. So he's making a joke here about the eggs that are sold at supermarkets that say that they come from cage-free hens who are treated humanely. The, the joke is, why aren't there any cartons that say these ones are mistreated, huh? Oh, you're not funny, bro. I just, oh. This next picture that I took, I'm pretty sure is just to show you how long and ridiculous this sentence is. The name has always occupied a space between the concrete and the abstract, the individual and the social, but when it begins to be shaped and charged with meaning in places removed from the physical world, in that way entering the world of fiction, albeit unseen by the majority, at the same time as this fictional world is expanding and taking up an ever greater part of our lives, the TV screens are now not only in our own rooms but also on the walls of our trains and under the luggage bins of our planes, in the waiting rooms of our doctor's offices and the halls of our banks, even in the supermarkets, quite apart from our carrying them around in the form of laptop computers and cell phones, in such a way that we inhabit two realities, one abstract and image-based, in which all kinds of people and places present themselves before us with nothing in common, but being somewhat other than where we are, and one concrete physical, which is the one we move around in and are more palpably a part of, when we arrive at a point where everything is either fiction or seen as fiction, the job of the novelist can no longer be to write more fictions. That was one sentence. What the heck? So that, I hope, just makes clear the wannabe pretentiousness that I was dealing with in trying to read this book. And this type of stuff would go on for pages. I have another example of this. In a novel, the name works like a face. On the first encounter, it's new and unfamiliar, but spending even a short time in its presence, you start associating certain characteristics with it. Then gradually, if it remains near to you over time, a history, eventually an entire life, in that the faces with which you're familiar absorb all that you know about them without you necessarily being aware of the fact. In the case of an old friend walking toward you, that knowledge is patient, melted into the face, each and every aspect that to you comprises him or her. No, Carl Ove, no. Stop. Now this section comes from a portion of the book in which he was talking about Hitler. So first he quotes Hitler, Then from all the misery and despair, from all the filth and outward degeneration, it was no longer human beings that emerged, but the deplorable results of deplorable laws and the hardships of my own life, no easier than the others, preserved me from capitulating in tearful sentimentality to the degenerate products of this process of development. This is Karl Ove now speaking. This is a treacherous statement, typical not only of Hitler, but of the times. By saying it is not the fault of the individual that he or she has become brutalized, but of the system within which the individual exists, one thereby expresses a humanistic attitude by which it is emphasized that it is the conditions under which the people live that are unfit and wretched rather than the people themselves. However, one consequence of this is that the individual is thereby seen to be a manifestation of class, and if class is the important category here, then the life of the individual diminishes in value, being seen in relation to the common goal, not to the face or the name, but the mass and the number. So this is where that whole we comes into play again. And he's basically suggesting here that if an individual is suffering under an unjust system, you have to blame the individual, not the system that exploits the individual, because if you blame the system that exploits the individual, then you create class consciousness, and class consciousness is treacherous. This does not make sense. How can you refuse to accept that systems might exploit people and harm them? How can you deny that and say any suggestion of that is treacherous? Like, do we have to just like not believe our very eyes at a certain point and stick to this rigid individualism that everything that happens to us is our fault? If a child is born into poverty, is that the child's fault or is it the fault of the system? A newborn baby born into poverty. Is it the baby's fault? Does that make sense? Or is it possible that society has failed that baby? Editing Brandon here, and I just want to make clear that the concept that class solidarity or class consciousness devalues the individual is entirely ridiculous. If a bunch of individuals can all see that they are all being exploited for the benefit of one person at the top, but they can't work together to get out of it, what are they supposed to do? Goodness gracious, if it turns out that we are being systemically brutalized and exploited, how are we all as individuals supposed to pull ourselves out of that without helping each other? 
As for my point about babies being born into poverty, a baby does not have the choice to be born or not, and a baby does not have the ability to lift themselves out of poverty. So you could take that and say, well, the fault lies solely on the parents for being in poverty because there's nothing systemically that traps people in poverty and keeps them stuck there, which is not true. You might try to make that argument, but the fact is, is that you've already broken Carl Ove's rule because now you're grouping people into families, which devalues the individual. <laughs> it's so incredibly simplistic and foolish, and he says it in the biggest, grandest way he possibly can, and still it comes out sounding like trash. Now I'm gonna share with you some notes that I wrote while I was reading the 280 pages that I read. Carl Ove genuinely thinks that every country in Africa is incapable of running a government or forming schools. This is demonstrably false. Not only that, he thinks Africa should be cut off from the rest of the world to preserve their culture. Respectfully, Karl Ove, maybe an old white man from Europe doesn't know what's best for the continent of Africa. Next note, now he's complaining that his country said their national anthem was racist. I'm sorry, but how devoid of actual struggle does your life have to be for your biggest problem to be that you can't listen to your racist national anthem as much as you'd like to? Next note, Carl Ove spends multiple pages just describing cleaning up his kids' toys, most pointless thing I've ever read. Next note, Carl Ove wants to be a modernist so bad, James Joyce broke him. Next note, he has a full mental breakdown anytime his angry uncle uncle emails him demanding that he not release volume one. Greer actually makes consistent good points of why these emails shouldn't bother him, but it keeps on bothering him. Are there really going to be 1,100 pages of this? At the time that I wrote this note, I genuinely thought that all of this book was just gonna be that. I decided I would flip through the pages and see what happens. And what I realized was there is a 400 page section of this book that is entirely dead dedicated to Karl Ove full-on geeking out about Adolf Hitler. Apparently he bought the actual Mein Kampf, read it, and decided to do a full breakdown of Hitler's life and writings. I have never seen a man this desperate to be original. He is just oozing with this energy of, I'm not like other rich white European boys. I have an unhealthy obsession with Hitler. <laughs> Next note. I've started flipping through the pages and every paragraph for pages on end has been starting with him talking about the word gales in what must hold the record for the most minuscule breakdown of a poem ever written. After reading the whole we versus I thing, I actually wrote my own thoughts on it. So I'll read some of that to you. Perhaps Carl's disliking of the we is suggesting that the Germans banded together under a unified Nazi we, and that we caused the Holocaust. The problem is what he's actually talking about here is dehumanization. Karl Ove shouldn't be opposed to we in all its forms. He should be opposed to violent nationalism combined with anti-Semitism and racism. That was the specific we that the Nazis functioned under. It was an exclusionary we. That was the problem, not just the word we all by itself in all of its forms across all of language. At the same time that the Nazis were doing that under their we, there was another we who opposed the Nazis and fought back against their ideology. If I think in terms of I and never we, why should I worry about anything other than I. Why would an I worry about a we that is being oppressed so long as the I is fine? A hyper-individualistic society would only function by removing all empathy. And without empathy, not only would we not save anyone from suffering, but no one would save us if we were suffering. You can't just write off the word we. That's asinine. That's the idea of a wannabe intellectual trying desperately to sound smart and original after admitting that he thinks a Nazi sympathizer is a perfect example of true morality. The reality, Karl Ove, is that nobody can exist solely as an I. We rely on others in literally all aspects of life. The idea of moving into the woods and living off the land, off the grid, that isn't sustainable for 7.9 billion people. But even for the few who might manage to make that work, they still have benefited from the greater we. Our food, our clothing, our cars, our houses, our furniture, our toiletry products, everything we buy comes from the collective work of of a massive network of we. A pair of shoes doesn't come from one person gathering all the raw materials, taking them home to their workbench, painstakingly making the shoes, and then selling them directly to you. No, 
The raw materials for shoes are harvested by different people in different companies in different locations. Due to capitalism, a lot of the labor to actually make a lot of our shoes takes place in sweatshops. Then it gets shipped by shipping companies to stores where different people do the retail work of selling the shoes. So where is this I? We only have our clothing and our food and our hygiene products and our cars and our packages and our mail delivered on time and everything else because of the greater we. To suggest to dream that we could all become these hyper-individualistic people who bear all of the responsibility for everything is, it's laughable. We're all in this together. We are a whole human race. We represent a bit of life itself. We're right there in the ecosystems with all the animals and all the plants. What can I say? <clears throat> my final takeaway is that My Struggle Volume 6 is the most god-awful, nonsensical, pointless, childish, hypocritical, Hitler-obsessed, long-winded, pseudo-intellectual, Nazi-sympathizing, whining, pseudo-modernist, unreadable, unbearable, tasteless, thoughtless, illogical, ill-conceived, stupid, meaningless, ignorant, unintelligent, and overall just plain dumb book I've ever tried to read. This book wants us to ask the most pointless question ever conceived, which is, am I a Nazi for being part of a fairly large we who all hate Nazis? Or is it possible that Karl Ove might be the Nazi for saying in his book called My Struggle that a Nazi sympathizer who mourned Hitler's death is more moral than the people who hate Nazis? If you're wondering if you should read the Karl Ove series, I hope that this video helps you come to a decision. When I was considering if I should genuinely quit this book at this point in the game, there was one thought that convinced me that I should stop this. And that is that this year I made the resolution to read more books by women. So it is entirely ridiculous for me to waste any more time struggling through the incredible, incredible bullshit that is this book. I am on my way to the library right now to pick up another Isabel Allende book, which I'm very excited to read. And I'm also going to be picking up a book by Joyce Carol Oates, who I've never read before, but I'm pretty excited about that. I've also decided to read Maya Angelou's autobiography series because I expect that it will be way better than this mess. That's all I have to say. Thank you for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the books that I'm reading, subscribe. I do monthly book videos. Oh. My throat is like genuinely in pain right now. <laughs>